Hello, my name is Homer Knox and I'm at the Life Center in Bradenton, Florida. The Life Center is a Christian residential discipleship program in Bradenton, Florida and it's, I'm always glad to be working with the men tonight. Our subject tonight is the Passover and so we want to talk on the Passover a little bit. The Passover is God's deliverance of the Jews from under the bondage of Egypt. God's deliverance you pass over, pass over. And it's a pilgrimage festival. Uh, Passover is one of the three pilgrimage festivals in Scripture, uh, during which the Jews were commanded to travel to Jerusalem and observe the feast together. And it's been celebrated for approximately 2,500 years. There are many comparisons between the Passover and Easter, and we're going to look at some of those. Uh, the Passover festival was a seven-day festival. It uh, celebrates the Jews' exodus from Egypt and freedom from slavery, bondage. And Jesus and his disciples were Jewish, and they, and they celebrated the Passover. Hey, Scott. Christians, we celebrate Easter, and that's a celebration of the sinless life the death and the resurrection of Jesus. It releases us from the sin bondage, Jesus, his sacrifice. It's a celebration forever. Exodus, the 12th chapter, the 14th verse. Now this day will be a memorial to you, and you shall celebrate it as a feast of the Lord. Throughout your generations, you are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. And so they do it every year. They've been doing it for thousands of years, sir. Let's do the background of the Passover. Uh, there was a famine in the earth. There was a famine in the earth, and it was going to happen for seven years. And the patriarchs are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's the founders of the Jewish faith. And Jacob's boy was Joseph. And Joseph's brothers hated him, and they sold him into slavery to the Midianites. He was out looking for them in the, in the desert, and they found him and said, let's sell this sucker out of here. And so that's what they did. And then the Midianites went into Egypt, and they sold him to Potiphar, who was, in, who was a pharaoh um, officer. He was an officer of pharaoh. Well, Joseph was put in prison, and Potiphar, it's a long story, but he was put in prison, and then some of the guys in the prison there that worked for pharaoh had visions and dreams. And so Joseph, God gave Joseph the ability to interpret that. So one of the guys, the, I think the chief butcher, went back to Pharaoh after his time was up, and Pharaoh had a dream. And no one could interpret the dream, and so this butcher says, hey, I know a guy that can interpret dreams. And so they bring Joseph out of jail. Genesis, the 41st chapter, the 16th verse. Joseph then answered Pharaoh, saying, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable response. See that humbleness in Joseph? It's just wonderful. Men of God are humble. Men of God are humble. Genesis, the 41st chapter, the 41st verse. Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Well, the question was, we're going to have a, fa we're going to have a famine. What are we going to do? And Pharaoh says, Well, who's the smartest person to handle that? And then he thinks, well, you are Joseph because you've given me the vision. And so he makes him head over the Egypt, land of Egypt. And then Joseph wants to move his family over, his father and his brothers over to Egypt or they'll die in the famine. And so God speaks to Jacob, Joseph's father. Genesis, the 46th chapter, the fourth verse. I will be down with you to Egypt and I will also surely bring you up again. And Joseph will close your eyes. 70 people went down. 70 Jews went down. Israelis went down. Well, Joseph died. His brother died. They all die. And there's a new Pharaoh comes into place. And he doesn't know or want to know about Joseph and what he did. And so they took advantage of the Jews. Exodus, the first chapter, the 11th verse. So they appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor. Exodus, the first chapter, the 22nd verse. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who was born you are to cast into the Nile, and every daughter you are to keep alive. So they didn't want the Jews to, to the population to expand any. They were going to kill all the male childs. 
Um, and God prevents that, some of that anyway, through the, through the midwives. The midwives, the Jewish midwives who had helped in the birth, didn't listen. But they have found big sections of graves of young babies in there. And that was from, I'm sure, Pharaoh's time, what he did. You want to remember that God's aware of everything. He's not just up there. He's, he's, he's thinking about us. He's watching us. And God is aware. Proverbs, the 15th chapter, the third verse. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, watching the evil and the good. Exodus, the third chapter, the seventh verse. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. Surely seen my affliction. And then they need somebody to, to move them out. And God selected Moses. Exodus, the third chapter, the tenth verse. Therefore, come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. Remember the story about Moses, maybe you don't. Remember the story about Moses on the mountain and, the, and the, blame, the flaming bush, and that was God in the bush, the spirit was in the bush, and he talked to Moses, and Moses tries to get out of it, doesn't want to do it. He said, I don't talk well, I'm not eloquent in speech, uh, but God prevails, and Moses humbles himself and goes. Exodus, the sixth chapter, the sixth verse. Say, therefore, to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage, and I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Well, how does deliver you from bondage sound for us? Redeem you with an outstretched arm. What does that sound like? Sounds like our Redeemer, doesn't it? Sounds like Jesus. He redeemed us. We have a promise of a redeemer for us. Isaiah, the ninth chapter, the sixth verse. For a child, speaking of Jesus, will be born to us. A son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. It's time to request Pharaoh to leave. They want to go to Pharaoh, and they say, let my people go. Exodus, the eighth chapter, the first verse. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Serve me. Isn't that our purpose as Christians? To serve him? We're called the same thing as the Israelis were, to serve him. Once we're born again, we stop serving the enemy and we start serving Jesus. Praise God. Exodus, the seventh chapter, the fifth verse. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the sons of Israel from their midst. And I have over here on the left hand side, you have it in your sheets, is don't listen, whack. Don't listen, whack. And there were 10 plagues God brought on Egypt. 10 plagues God used to punish Egypt. Number one, water turned into blood. Number two, frogs. Number three, gnats, lice. Number four, swarms of incense. Number five, death of livestock. Number six is boils. Number seven, hail. Number eight, locust. Number nine, darkness. And finally, number 10, the death of the firstborn. Now, you'd think after about the third or fourth plague, you'd say, all right, all right, you guys, have a great time. We'll see you later. No, nope. They get their heart hard. Get their heart hard. Exodus, the eighth chapter, the 32nd verse. But Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also. And he did not let the people go. Uh, well, the tribulation, we have some things going on too, don't we? What are they? Several punishments during the tribulation. Number one is fish in the ocean destroyed. Number two is boils. Number three, sea turned into blood. Number four is hailstones. Number five, insects. Number six, darkness. And finally, number seven, scorpions. A lot of those are just like the plagues in Egypt, aren't they? Yep. And that's one of the reasons that some people say that the church will go through the tribulation because of that. Because of that. I don't believe that way. I believe we'll be gone before the tribulation. Exodus 11, 2. They're getting ready to leave now. Exodus, the 11th chapter, the second verse. Speak now in the hearings of the people that each man asks from his neighbor and each woman from her neighbor for articles of silver and articles of gold. And so they didn't leave empty-handed. They didn't leave empty-handed. 
Now, does anybody know why they got all this stuff other than to obey God? What they used it for? They, they used it for because in the desert they built the tabernacle, a place to worship God. And these materials were used to build that. Gold, silver, stones, cloth, and they got that from the Egyptians. There wouldn't be anywhere to get it in the desert. The Passover is a meal celebration and it's one of many feasts. It's called a Seder meal at the Passover. S-E-D-E-R. And Seder means order. It means order. It's a Jewish ritual service and ceremonial dinner for the first night or the first two nights of the Passover. Jesus and his disciples, they were Jews, right? And they celebrated the Passover. The Last Supper is the Passover supper for them. And Bonnie and I attended a Seder meal up at Christian Retreat one time. They brought in a Messianic rabbi, and there's prayers that you go through, and there's meals, parts of the meals you eat. You eat slowly on different parts, and it was really, it was really enjoyable. Really enjoyed it. I, I uh, appreciated that. The first night of the uh, Passover feast was the night of the tenth plague. Leaven. Leaven is sin. Exodus, the twelfth chapter, the nineteenth verse. Seven days thou shalt be no leaven or yeast found in your houses. For whoever eats what is leaven, that person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is an alien or a native of the land. In the Seder, for the Seder meal, you go through your house and you throw out anything that has leaven in it. Okay, you have no leaven in your house. No leaven. Matter of fact, for the kids, they hide leaven somewhere. And they make the kids search the house, and then they find it. It's a big deal for them, you know, to get, get rid of the leaven. You ever have matzah? A little matzah cracker? A little thin, flat, flat cracker? And that's what they eat. There's no leaven in there. Communion bread. It's communion bread a lot of times. Is that? That's right. I was up at Detweiler's up here, and, and they had big cases of it for sale. Bonnie and I used to take... We don't do it anymore because of lacks of day schoolness. But we used to have communion every morning, first thing in the morning. Before I'd go to work, she'd be up. We'd have, we'd have matzah there, and we'd take a little piece of that, and we'd have juice there too. And we'd take communion between us. Between us. It was meaningful. That communion thing's a big thing. It's a really big thing when you have a church. And that's a time for you to cry. When does your heaven are open at that time? And that's a time for you to cry out for God for whatever you need. If you need a healing, man, you just need to claim the blood. You know, if you need work, you need to do that then. That's a time that God, I want to say, is more, more not interested in, in answering your prayer, but he hears it more clearly maybe. That's what I want to say. You know, so that's an important time. I don't take that communion lightly. You know, I don't take that lightly. I, I, uh, I get serious when that happens. And really, if I get more serious, I'd be a couple days ahead praying that out. Make sure I don't have any, any sin in my life. Taking communion when you have sin in your life is a big mistake. 1 Corinthians 11, chapter, the 27th verse. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. And people, it says in the scriptures that people get sick and die from that. So you want to be careful of that. I have said no on communion several times in my life. Okay, so I'm not ready to take communion. My heart's not ready. Got some stuff going on here that I need to clean out. And so I just say no. Also, and this is just me, because I've had communion all these years, I, I have. I'm old-fashioned in the way I want communion, and there's ways they serve communion that I don't enjoy. Okay, I don't have to tell you what that is, but they're just way. And so at those times, sometimes I don't take it. I remember at Christian Treat, they had a trucker group come in. And man, I'll tell you what, those guys could preach. They were just unbelievable. But they had a, you know, they were all in a tent, and there were a couple hundred people there. And they had little uh, cups of communion and the bread all sealed up. And they'd take it and they'd throw that, you know, I caught mine. And then I opened it up and there was the juice and there was a the little cake. It was really nice. Let's talk about the order now of uh, the Seder meal. Exodus, the 12th chapter, the third verse. On the 10th of this month, they are each one to take an unblemished lamb for themselves, according to their father's households. Unblemished. Well, Christ is unblemished, isn't he? He's a perfect example of that. Unblemished. Exodus, the 12th chapter, the fifth verse. Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Sacrifice an unblemished male lamb. There's the Christ thing, male. 
And who is the unblemished lamb? Well, it's Jesus. You kill the male lamb at twilight. Jesus died at 3 p.m. And he had to die at 3 p.m. because that's when the temple sacrifice was killed. And he was the sacrifice. Exodus, the 12th chapter, the 7th verse. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. The sprinkling of the blood on the doorpost was a symbol of open confession and our allegiance and our love for God. Sprinkling of the blood. We need the blood sprinkled on our life, don't we? You know, we claim that blood. We don't sprinkle it on us. We don't get blood. But we claim the blood. We claim the blood. Doesn't do you any good not to have it on the doorpost and lentil, doesn't it? Those guys that got lackadaisical died, didn't they? The firstborn died anyway. Firstborn died. It's kind of like baptism. The doorpost and the lentil. Believer's baptism. Baptism is a symbol of our acceptance of Christ and his blood sacrifice. Baptism. It's the sealing with the Holy Spirit. It's a great example of the blood on the doorpost. I claim the blood for my family every day on my prayer list. It's on my prayer list. I just claim the blood. And I go right down through my family members. My, I claim the blood first in my mind and my body. Because you know, you have thoughts sometimes. And so I want that, I want that blood, that cleansing blood to cleanse that out. Seder meal, uh, Exodus 12, 8. Exodus, the 12th chapter, the 8th verse. They shall eat the flesh that same night, roasted with fire. And they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Exodus 12, 9, it was expressly forbidden. It should not be boiled. Exodus, the 12th chapter, the 9th verse. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled at all with water, but rather roasted with fire. And why? Because the sorcerers and all those weird magic guys, they used the intestines and all the insides of animals in their worship. And so when you roast it, you roast that out. They can't use them anymore. If you boiled it, you could still use those internal parts. Exodus, the 12th chapter, the 46th verse. It is to be eaten in a single house. You are not to bring forth any of the flesh outside of the house, nor are you to break any bone of it. And a bone would not be broken on the animal. Where'd that come from? Where's that? Isn't Christ, there wasn't a bone broken in Christ? Psalm, the 34th chapter, the 20th verse. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. All that beating he took, all on the cross, and there wasn't a bone broken. It's a great example, great example of Jesus and what he did. John, the 19th chapter, the 36th verse. For these things came to pass to fulfill the scripture. Not a bone of him shall be broken. Uh, lamb will, lamb's an animal that will let you sacrifice it. It won't fight. It won't fight. And it's just, just like Jesus. That's why they say he's the Lamb of God. As he willingly sacrificed himself, the Lamb of God. Exodus, the 12th chapter, the 11th verse. Now you shall eat it in this manner, with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Well, why is he telling them to do that? Because they need to be prepared for the journey, don't they? They're leaving. As soon as everybody realizes that somebody's dead, Pharaoh's going to throw them out. And so they had to do it that way. Symbolic. Prepared for the journey. We do so with readiness and desire to serve Jesus, to enter the service of Christ, and to go on the journey to heaven. Exodus, the 12th chapter, the 13th verse. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. See the blood, I will what? Pass over. Well, that's why they call it Passover. Yeah. God is going to pass over. The death angel's gone through Egypt. And he's killing people. But it says he will pass over when he sees the blood. What else does it say? And no plague will be, befall you to destroy you. Well, there's really two things here with that blood, isn't it? There was a plague involved, and there was the death angel going around. Passing over the doom of sin by Christ's blood. Praise God. The Passover was useless unless it was eaten, wasn't it? There's the lamb. I don't feel like it. I don't want to do it. And so, you know, we're useless without Jesus Christ in our life, aren't we? We're just useless. Exodus, the 12th chapter, the 8th verse. And they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Bitter herbs represent all the years in bondage slavery. That's the purpose of that. Exodus, the 12th chapter, the 29th verse. 
Now it came about at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. So every family took a hit. Exodus, the 12th chapter, the 30th verse. Pharaoh arose in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was no home where there was not someone dead. Now think about that. All your neighbors, wherever you've lived, somebody died in that house. My, oh my. No wonder there was a great outcry. Pharaoh has somebody dead in his house, and he realized what has happened, and then in Exodus 12, 31, Exodus, the 12th chapter, the 31st verse, Pharaoh is talking. Rise up and get out from among my people, both you and the sons of Israel, and go, worship the Lord as you have said. See, there's weeping and wailing in all the streets. Everywhere there is, there's people crying. There's people going off. Horrible scene. Numbers, the 33rd chapter, the third verse. On the next day after the Passover, the sons of Israel started out boldly in the sight of all the Egyptians. The group was a mixed multitude. What's a mixed multitude? It's what we have in church here. We have a mixed multitude. We have Christians and we have non-Christians. Yes. Right? That's a mixed multitude. Not everybody who goes to our church is a Christian. Yeah. You know, they're not. And we hope they are. We want them to be. But it's not the case. And when I teach on the rapture, one of the things I say is, the rapture will happen. There will still be people who show up here. Because yeah. they weren't born again. And so... It was a mixed multitude, about 600,000 men. Now, do you remember the Cuban boat lift, if you're old enough? They had a deal here. Cubans sent a whole bunch of people over. Well, you know what they did? They opened up all the prisons, and they opened up all the bad boys that wanted out of there, and uh, they sent them over here. I'm sure that's the way it went out of Egypt, that they emptied their prisons, all the people they had problems with, they sent them out. And the rapture we talked, it's going to separate the mixed multitude in the church. It's going to separate. Uh, I use this story, I, I love this story, and I use it. When I lived in Lancaster, they had a field in the back of the house, and it, it grew soybeans and corn. And here's the way they did it. One year it was corn, the next year it was soybean. Next year it was corn, next year they rotated each year. And so the year that they had soybeans, one of the years, and we'd go back and go through these soybeans. You ever see a soybean plant? You know what, anybody knows what it looks like? It, it goes about this big. It's blush green, just absolutely beautiful. And so we're going through this field, and we said, this field, and as far as you can see, this field is all soybeans. It's just all soybeans here. Well, the harvest time came, just like Christ is coming, the harvest time is coming. And the leaves died on the plant. They turned yellow, then they turned brown, and then they died. Yeah. All right? And then they fell off, and it's just the stock coming up. And you know what? We go out in that field, and there's all this other green plants here, all these other green foliage. Over there, there's one. Over there, there's one. And that's what's going to happen in the rapture. Even though it's the church, a lot of non-believers in church, a lot of non-believers. There's a whole bunch, you know. And so that's what happened. The rapture is going to separate all that, just like they did here in Egypt. Exodus, the 12th chapter, the 40th verse. Now the time that the sons of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. Who did they take out of Egypt when they left? They took the bones of Joseph. Joseph asked the people to take him out when they, when they took off. He had that faith thing, you know, that works by faith. He had a faith, he believed God was going to get him out of there. He didn't know when. 400 years later. And so they took his bones with them and buried them in Israel. Exodus, the 13th chapter, the 19th verse. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones from here with you. They disobeyed God the whole way through the wilderness, and then they didn't want to go into the promised land. And so God punished them. They would all die in the wilderness except for Joshua and Caleb. 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, the 5th verse. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Numbers, the 26th chapter, the 65th verse. And not a man was left of them except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. And, and these guys, they're all their families are died. Everybody died. Now their children are the ones that got the promised land. Well, disobedience ended Israel's goal to their destination of the promised land. Their children entered, but they didn't enter. How horrible. Just think about that. 
in the desert 40 years and you don't get to go in. Must have been bad. You know, and disobedience is going to end your journey with Jesus. You're disobedient, you get disobedient, you get rebellious, it will end your journey of victory in this life. You're all on a way to journey now. You're on a journey. And, and being obedient, being faithful will get you there. Being non-faithful and disobedience will end that. Because now that you get saved, to repent on that, to renew, very difficult. I haven't seen a whole lot of people, when they walked away from the faith, got renewed. Hebrews, the sixth chapter, the sixth verse. Those who then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. But for the most part, when they walk out, they walk out. It's done. It's a done deal. It's very sad. Passover is a great festival of God's power and His love for the Jewish people. It's a great festival. And likewise, Easter. Easter is a great festival of Jesus and His love for us, isn't it? It's a great festival. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to the Men Teaching Men YouTube channel. Thanks so much for watching. Hello friends, this is Homer Knox again. I hope you enjoyed this video teaching. The question I have for you is, are you born again? Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and are you saved? If not, why not? Why not? Jesus was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He suffered and died under Pontius Pilate and the Romans. He was buried and he rose from the dead on the third day after burial. And he's ascended into heaven according to the scriptures. There is salvation in no one else. No one else. And so if this has stirred your heart and you'd like to receive Jesus as your personal Savior, please pray with me. Dear Jesus, I accept you as my personal Savior. Come into my heart. Please forgive me of all my sins, all my sins. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for making me a new creature. And thank you for the Holy Spirit now living inside of me. Amen and amen. If you prayed this prayer for the first time from your heart, you're now born again. You're a Christian. Welcome. Welcome to the family. If you prayed this prayer after slipping away, you're now back in the fold. You're part of the kingdom. Welcome. Congratulations. There's another teaching on the menteachingmen.com website entitled, I Just Got Saved, Now What? And that video will help you on your new walk with Jesus Christ. God bless you. God bless you. Amen.